yes, it is completely desirable to live 80 years rather than 25, like 100 years ago. But this is not what, in the end, is going to determine your state of being, your way of being, as happiness being a way of being, not just a pleasurable experience. Because you can be miserable in a little paradise, and you can be absolutely fine away with the in your joy, even facing great uh, difficulties and circumstances. So this is your mind that's going to override those uh, elements. And to give you a, a striking example or images that Sonest Lama gave in Portugal once, having seen a lot of construction work been going on in the day, when he had a talk in the evening, he said, if you, to show how the state of mind overrides the outer conditions, he said, if you become the owner of a, of a highly luxurious flat on the 100th floor of a high-tech skyscraper and moving in that state of mind of being totally miserable, all you are going to look for is a window from which to jump. At the same time, you can see people who have this a brilliant sort of, sort of enthusiasm for life, taste for life, even conditions seem sort of quite difficult. So that's why the inner transformation is required. Now, from the perspective of the contemplative, this is something self-verified. And, and of course, it's also desirable that other people is verified. I mean, if you think that you, you got rid of anger, but people say, no, this guy is just the same as I've ever known him, but then probably you should reconsider your meditation. <laughs> you know, we say it's fine for a meditator to be compassionate and happy when he's sitting with full belly in the sun at the door of his hermitage, but is confronted with the circumstances of life that the meditator is put on the scales. So yes, if we can go through the ups and downs of life, if you find to cultivating genuine happiness and human qualities, the resources, inner resources, inner strength, inner confidence to deal with whatever comes your way, I mean, that's a real change. And that allows you to change the world again. I mean, to come back to the humanitarian world where I engage myself where all those problems come from, if not from lack of human qualities? Why, in some country, I heard a report recently, I forgot where it is, in Burundi or somewhere, $17 million were given to give free uh, tree therapy to all the AIDS patients in that country. Uh, and, and out of that, 80% ever, ever, ever reached the people. They go once, they get one, one dose of treatment, and then they can never get the second one. They have to buy it on the black market. This is all due because of basic lack of human concern, of compassion, honesty, and so forth. So it's all the more when you try to help others that basic human qualities are required, and that's why you need to, ch to change ourselves. And the clashes of ego that happens among different organizations, that's also the same. So if you can to put yourself at the service of others, we need, it's not a waste of time to go for a while, either to spend 15, 20 minutes a day trying to do that, or take a little more time to train those human qualities purposely. So now, so for the meditator, it is something that is naturally verified in his or her own life. But now it's interesting that since you know, the, the Buddhist approach has always been an empirical and pragmatic approach of, of, of reality, of the mind, and so there's never been a real conflict with science. Simply there are different domains of Modern science has been mostly the domains of, of natural uh, phenomena, of physics and biology. The contemplative science of Buddhism has been dealing with the workings of the mind, but somehow with the same empirical approach you know, to untie or unravel the mechanisms of happiness and suffering in an in experiential way. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We don't have to stick to some kind of dogma. So therefore, the, the meeting between science and psychology especially, and neuroscience also in particular, was uh, very natural. And it happens uh, since 20 years that it's always, uh, expressed a strong interest for science. And all the more, after one of those meetings in 2000 on destructive emotion in Dharamsala, where halfway through the week, it was said that a research program would be started. And so that's about studying the long-term effect of meditation on the mind. So. Uh, I wish to show you a few things, and I hope if any of, the, of you were here yesterday, forgive me for being part of the civilization of repetition. But uh, anyway, 
So, if, John, if you don't mind sending the slides. So those are the places where the meditators that went to the lab cam, come from. So it's easier to, you might think it's easier to meditate there than in the subway. That's, that's correct. <laughs> so next one, please. So again. Okay, so that's wonderful natural places. And of course, in the beginning, a natural places can be, or a quiet place at least in, in your home, it's not that you want to run away, but you just want to have the leisure to, to achieve that mind training, even for 15 minutes. You don't want to be playing cards and doing this at the same time. This, this just doesn't work. So next one, please. Yeah, again. Next one. Yes, next one. Again. Okay. Next one. Next one. The hottest day of the year in the Anima Chen in Tibet, August 1st. <laughs> Next one. Next one. So here is uh, Kensei Rinpoche, Tigo Kensei Rinpoche, who is also one of the teachers of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I had the great fortune to spend 13 years almost continuously with him. And what a spiritual teacher is, is not a, you know, a overarching figure who manipulates every instant of, instances of your life. Uh, in, in, a, in a self-interested manner, is someone who really has nothing to lose, nothing to gain, except giving uh, ways, like the Buddha said, I show you the ways up to you to, to travel. He's giving by what he is and what he teaches, or she, what she is and teaches, uh, like the, the way to progress yourself. It's like someone who shows you what you could become with determination, effort, inspiration, and those is powerful example to see that it's possible somehow, to see an example of human perfection that you don't find sometimes in people who are very good at something like playing chess, but not necessarily that much inspiring as human beings. So there's some kind of sometimes a discrepancy. But here, as a person of wisdom, there should be a complete adequation between the teaching and the person. Otherwise, it's just do what I say, don't do what I do. And then, of course, who want to follow any kind of advice like that. Next one, please. Again, this is Kanjuri Moshe, my first teacher. Next one. And then, uh, sort of a jolly person. And he's just coming out of six years of retreat. So, the question is, is he so happy because at last he's coming out of six years of <laughs> What a relief. Or because he did six years retreat. And I, I would favor the second hypothesis because I, I was lucky enough to meet him while he was in retreat, and, and also I know him from before and after, and I think it's really the result of his special practice to be so carefree. And so a French uh, intellectual said, wrote something about all those monks and hermits who are rotting in their hermitage, he says. So I think he, he rather matured than got rotten. So <laughs> next one, please. Again, next. So here is uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, so there are two ways of studying meditation in the brain with electrodes, uh, electroencephalogram that measure very fast change in the brain. A thousandth of a second change can be recorded, but not so precise in localization, where it exactly happens in the brain. And then the next technique, yes, next one, another one, the next one too. So is the fMRI or the scanner which is the magnetic resonance and which is quite very good at localizing exactly in the brain where in three dimension it happens, but less precise in time. You only measure t changes of order of a second. And this, usually we spend two and a half hours this time, so it's, the re it's like coming out of a space capsule or mini retreat. So everyone is relieved that we survived that ordeal. So next one. So now, there are many ways we can study meditation, and each seems to have a different signature in the brain. Focused attention doesn't have the same signature as compassion, or what we call open presence, or mental visualization or mental imagery. All those have different impact in the brain. 